Slavery. The war was about slavery. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> How is this even possible? Is it the school system? Is it your home life? Oh, come on, I was into that. That disgusting film is nothing more than Yankee propaganda. History is written by the victors. And now, through political correctness, today's media are rewriting as those of us with common sense know as true history. Well, that's a bunch of baloney, and you're living proof of that. Millions of people around the world believe that the South seceded in the Civil War because of states' rights and taxation. And through most of the 20th century, many Americans even regarded antebellum slavery as a relatively benevolent and humane institution. And I don't know if you remember, but you guys lost, like, big time. You got your asses handed to you. Simmer down. Your asses were surgically removed and physically placed within the grasp of thine own hands. All right, that's enough of your cheek. This is serious business. In elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, we all learned that the Civil War was about states' rights and all the reasons behind the war. But then, not too long ago, the narrative changed. And suddenly the Civil War was 100% about slavery and only slavery. Literally nothing else. I've literally watched history be rewritten in front of my eyes. But I suppose you think I'm just being ridiculous. No, I, I think you're right. The Civil War history is absolutely being rewritten. <laughs> Check me to the Lincolnites. <laughs> But, <laughs> history is always being rewritten. That's how it works. Historical hypotheses are made to be challenged and questioned as others bring attention to different evidence or come at the issue from illuminating new perspectives. That's right. There are always two sides of history, and both need to be heard even if you disagree with one point of view. Well, I think there's a hell of a lot more sides of history than just two. There are as many different perspectives on the Civil War as there were people who lived through it. But not all perspectives are valid history. Some narratives can be misleading, or even outright false, and for a historian to parrot them uncritically out of some misguided sense of inclusion is just really fucking irresponsible. What you consider to be the southern side of the story of the Civil War is literally just lost cause mythology. The lost cause isn't a valid point of view on anything. It's just a collection of factually incorrect claims. It's not a question of perspective or interpretation. This stuff is just demonstrably wrong. Says you. And what exactly do you and your cronies consider the lost cause myth? Because from what I've seen in your channel, anything that doesn't depict Confederate soldiers as bloodthirsty villains is lost cause propaganda. What you are calling the lost cause myth is so unbelievably broad, it could encompass essentially any unbiased review of the Civil War. Oh, I'm referring to something very specific when I talk about the Lost Cause myth. Essentially, it's a pro-Confederate belief system that emerged from the post-war histories of the White South. Its seeds were planted during the war itself, as Confederates tried to solicit international sympathy by distancing themselves from the cause of slavery for which they seceded, but it really came to the fore in the 1880s and 90s, when ex-Confederates began a systematic campaign to sanitize their reasons for secession and paint their actions during the war in the best possible light. Seems far-fetched to me. What, so former Confederates just rewrote history within living memory and everybody just went along with it? Pretty much, yeah. That's crazy. Is it? I mean, look at what's been happening in recent American history. No matter what side of the political divide you're on, I think you would confidently say that the people on the other side have deceived themselves into believing a narrative that's completely divorced from reality. Amen, brother. At least with the lost cause, there's a grain of truth. Like, if you squint at Civil War history and cock your head, you can kinda see it. But today, I mean, shit. Remember the gay frog guy? Lots of people were totally on board with the gay frog guy. People crave meaning in their lives. People desperately crave meaning, and myths can give it to us. Well, I say there was no lost cause. Stay rats! Well, let's look at some of the evidence. As we've talked about before, defense of home and hearth was not the only reason Confederate soldiers went to war. Defense of slavery and white supremacy were also powerful motivating factors, and a significant number of them said as much in their diaries and letters. Oh, gracious, this again. And I suppose this is where you bust out her racist quote. I literally have a whole duffel bag full of them. Uh, okay. Pick a quote. Any quote. <laughs> the 
the Vandals of the North are determined to destroy slavery. We must all fat, and I choose to fat for Southern Rats and Southern Liberty. Lunsford Yandale Jr., Staff Surgeon, 4th Tennessee Infantry, April 1861. Another one? Where are you going with this? You'll see. A stand must be made for African slavery, or it is forever lost. William Grimbo, 1st South Carolina Artillery, November 1860. Another? This country without slave labor would be completely worthless. We can only live and exist by that species of labor, and hence I am willing to fight to the last. William Nugent, 28th Mississippi Infantry, September 1863. Let me top you off there. Lincoln declares the blacks entitled to all the rights and privileges as American citizens. So imagine your sweet little girls in the schoolroom with a black woolly-headed Negro and have to treat them as their equal. William Garner, 10th Arkansas Cavalry, January 1864. Refills are free. I will show the Yankees that a white man is better than a that's a bad word. Jonas Bradshaw, 38th North Carolina Infantry, April 1862. And that guy was just a private, a poor farmer. Well, let's do one more, just because we're having so much fun. It is liberty or death with me. I love home and all that surrounds it as much as anybody. But if I have to be the equal to a nope, 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 nope. I had rather never come home. Better me fall in the struggle for it. Will McKee, 18th Georgia Infantry, September 1861. Jesus. There's a lot more where that came from in the duffel bag, but I don't want to belabor the point. We've covered this before. So. During the Civil War, many Confederate soldiers expressed very strong pro-slavery sentiments. But decades after the war, they changed their tune. In Sam Watkins' famous Confederate memoir, Company H, written 20 years after the events in question, the author plainly stated that, We believe in the doctrine of state rights. They in the doctrine of centralization. We only fought for our state rights. They for union and power. The South fell battling under the banner of state rights, but yet grand and glorious, even in death. Weird, right? Or we can listen to the 1947 audio interview of 101-year-old Confederate veteran Julius Howell, which has gone viral in a video posted by the eminent historian Black Confederate One, and is often touted as definitive proof that Confederate soldiers did not fight for slavery. The South did not fight for the preservation or extension of slavery. My friend, it was a great curse on this country that we had slavery. And I thank God that I did not bring up my boys and girls under a system of slavery under which I was brought under. What did you boys fight for then? For states' rights. For states' rights. And it wasn't just the soldiers who were saying this stuff. The men of the upper echelon of the Confederate government, former plantation owners who, in 1860, had shouted from the mountaintops that they were seceding to preserve slavery, seemed to suffer from a severe case of post-war amnesia. So said Jefferson Davis in his memoirs, Slavery was in no wise the cause of the conflict. And as former Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens argued in 1868, The conflict on this question of slavery was not a contest between the advocates or opponents of that peculiar institution. So what changed? What happened? The lost cause happened. Look, after 1865, material conditions in the rebellious states were dire. Southern wealth had been reduced by 60% down from pre-war levels, caused as much by Confederate mismanagement as by Union invasion. Half of all their farm machinery was inoperable, the railroad system was in ruins, and what little industrial capability they had was utterly destroyed. These factors had a dramatic, negative impact on white Southerners' quality of life, and the humiliation of defeat was psychologically devastating. 
In their personal correspondences, many Confederates wrote frankly about their experiences of despondence and hopelessness after the surrender. Many fell into a spiral of anxiety, depression, and alcohol abuse. The imagery that pervades their writings were of death and darkness, gloom in the tomb. With the power of the slavocracy forever shattered, ex-Confederates of the plantation class would soon have to jostle for political power against a whole host of highly motivated new rivals. Upcountry unionists, white yeoman farmers, Afro-Creole elites, and Republican freedmen. And all these other Southerners had something that ex-Confederates distinctly lacked. A story. A unifying mythology that defined them as a group and a people. In 1865, what was the Confederate story? Rebels, failures, slavers, traitors. As an early leader of the United Confederate Veterans put it, If we cannot justify the South in the act of secession, we will go down in history solely as a brave, impulsive, but rash people who attempted in an illegal manner to overthrow the union of our country. It was a fate worse than death an eternally dishonorable reputation. Something had to be done to avoid it. Ex-Confederates needed to improve their self-image. Less than a year after Appomattox, one Georgia newspaper predicted that the victory over Southern arms is to be followed by a victory over Southern opinions. Ex-Confederates were determined to control the narrative. And almost as soon as the guns went silent, they rushed to write and publish Southern-centric histories of the war between the states. Seems they were right to do so. The time proved that newspaper man right. Marxist, Maoist, mainstream historians have made it their non-binary mission to shove a plant-based civil war narrative down our collective throats. Descendants of the Confederacy take pride in their ancestors and should be allowed to honor them as New England and other regions honors their ancestors. But the Confederacy has been unfairly disparaged by today's cultural genocide that is also degrading the Founding Fathers and other once esteemed aspects of American heritage. Well, you're allowed to honor your Confederate ancestors just like you're allowed to buy truck nuts. You're free to do these things, they just make you look like a fucking asshole. And cultural genocide. Jesus Christ, you're a drama queen. But is that term not apropos for the Reconstruction era, Sam? We had failed to achieve political independence, but in undertaking to write our own histories, we began a fight for cultural independence that would become an enduring part of American life. What? It's very uncanny how you go from just totally insane to completely reasonable at the drop of a hat. It's just profoundly weird. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The first major offensive of this cultural war of independence came in 1866, when Edward A. Pollard, the wartime editor of the Richmond Examiner, began publishing his war histories, most notably The Lost Cause, a new southern history of the War of the Confederates, which is probably the origin of the term. Rabidly pro-slavery before the war, Pollard went on to become a Confederate true believer and a tireless evangelist of the southern side of history. In his books, Pollard did not deny that slavery played a role in secession, but tempered his analysis with white supremacist apologia. The occasion of that conflict was what the Yankees called, by one of their convenient labels in political nomenclature, slavery. But what was, in fact, nothing more than a system of Negro servitude in the South, one of the mildest and most beneficent systems of servitude in the world. This claim was still pretty close to the wartime Confederate Party line. At this early stage, the exact tenets of the myth were still unformed. But very quickly, more and more Southern histories began to deny that slavery had had anything to do with secession, instead fixating on more defensible motives like states' rights, libertarian government, and anti-industrialism. The first issue of the Southern Historical Society papers, an influential lost cause periodical, indicated a subtle but definitive shift in Southern historiography. The late Civil War which raged in the United States has been very generally attributed to the abolition of slavery, as it's called. But a close study of the history of the times will bring us to the conclusion that it was a fear of a mischief far more extensive and deeper even than this, which drove cool and reflected minds in the South to believe it was better to make the death struggle at once than to submit tamely to what was inevitable. Had the South permitted her property, her constitutional rights, and her liberties to be surreptitiously taken from her without resistance and make no moan, would she not have lost her honor with them? If the alternative were between such a loss and armed resistance, 
Is it surprising that she preferred the latter? Lost Cause writers paid particular attention in those early days to rehabilitating the reputations of key Confederate leaders, especially Robert E. Lee. No one was more instrumental in this than Lee's old division commander Jubal Early, who published the first book-length memoir of any Civil War general late in 1866. Drawing on experience from his years as a lawyer, Early began a campaign of ideas that was so scorched earth it would have made Sherman blush. His histories defended every last aspect of Lee's generalship, and when any historian dared to disparage the old hero, Early viciously attacked them in print. For decades after the Civil War, no one ever took up a pen to write about the conflict without living in mortal fear of Jubal Early. Old Jube simply wished to defend General Lee from the defamations and detractions of ignorant persons. Concerning the Battle of Gettysburg, for example, he set the record straight. Some said Moss Robert was responsible for our defeat. Imagine that, it's nonsense. General Longstreet, bless his heart, failed to carry out Lee's order to attack at dawn on July the 2nd. If he had attacked promptly, we would have carried the day and won the battle. I doubt it not. Well, there's only one problem with that, which is that no dawn order was ever given. As far as anybody knows, Early made that little factoid up at Lee's birthday celebration in Lexington, Virginia in 1872, and a lot of Confederate veterans who had been officers at Gettysburg were kind of baffled by it. But Early kept repeating it and writing about it, and William Nelson Pendleton, Lee's old chief of artillery, dutifully propagated the lie in his writing. It would become so prevalent that it was part of most histories of the Battle of Gettysburg until well into the 20th century. But what possible reason would they have to fib? Well, because Longstreet had quarreled with Lee, and Longstreet had been right. After the war, he publicly criticized Lee's leadership, so he was high on Jubal's shit list. Not to mention he famously became a Republican and worked closely with the Grant administration to help enfranchise freedmen during Reconstruction. Wait, so when I call him a scalawag, I'm basically just saying that he didn't completely hate black people? Yeah, that's more or less the historic context of that word. A scalawag is a white southerner who doesn't completely hate black people, and a carpetbagger is a white northerner who doesn't completely hate black people. Oh. Yeah. Well, then why didn't Longstreet try to defend himself, huh? If he was so blameless and innocent. He did. Just badly. His public retorts to Early and Pendleton were ponderous and tone-deaf and full of sloppy misstatements of fact. It only made him more unpopular, and his inaccuracies gave lost cause evangelists an opening to shred his credibility. You call these historians evangelists like the Lost Cause was some sort of religion or something. <laughs> well, it kind of became one in a way, especially after Reconstruction. In the 1870s, the tenets of the Lost Cause consolidated themselves into a coherent mythology. Slavery wasn't a major cause of the war, states' rights, tariffs, whatever, Lincoln was a tyrant slash northern aggression, the Confederate army was completely badass and Bob Lee was the perfect man, Sherman was worse than Genghis Khan and the Union army was full of rapers and pillagers, basically the stuff you and I have been talking about for years now. Black people and everybody up north still thought this stuff was pretty bonkers. Union veterans organizations were particularly outspoken in their skepticism and disgust, but it came to be widely believed in the White South. And just as people congregate in churches, temples, or mosques to worship their god, Southerners congregated at reunions, funerals, and monument dedications to reinforce their cultural myth through ceremony and ritual. Oh, come on. These were veterans' reunions, not the black sleep of Kalima. Uh, these events were just soldiers hanging out and reminiscing. What's the big deal? Oh, but it was so much more than that. These were profoundly meaningful events for these people, and the level of reverence on display was over the top even by Victorian standards. The ecclesiastical aspects were overt. Southern religious leaders had been among the most vocal secessionists, and later became some of the most passionate lost cause evangelists. Sermons delivered by these men were a mainstay of post-war ceremonies, blending evangelical Protestantism with the emerging theology of the Confederate Redeemer nation. Reverend J. William Jones, a wartime chaplain, Baptist preacher, and key contributor to the Southern Historical Society papers, typically began his prayers with the words, Oh God, 
God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Israel, God of the centuries, God of our fathers, God of Jefferson Davis, Robert Edward Lee, and Stonewall Jackson, Lord of hosts and King of kings. Like any other religion, the lost cause had its pantheon. Lee and Davis, having suffered for their people, were identified with Christ. Stonewall Jackson, long-bearded and wild-eyed, syncretized with Moses. Longstreet, that errant disciple and betrayer, was Judas. The Lost Cause had its iconography. The battle flag was as sacred and ubiquitous as the crucifix. And as monuments started springing up all over the South in the 1880s and 90s, graven images of Confederate saints were imbued with special significance as altars and gathering places. Wartime artifacts took on the quality of medieval relics, and veterans' organizations were encouraged to guard official Confederate documentation, as one united daughter of the Confederacy put it, as zealously as the children of Israel did the Ark of the Covenant. Lost Cause histories were literally referred to as catechisms. You can still find one on the Sons of Confederate Veterans website. So ex-Confederates were a little extra in their commemorations of the war. So what? Still seems pretty innocuous to me. Not so much. There was always a political dimension to Lost Cause ceremonies, and political advocacy was an important function of veterans groups, mainly in support of segregationist policies designed to continue white rule in the South. Politicians frequently spoke at Confederate reunions, and as the decades wore on, different political movements claiming the heritage of Lost Cause cultural memory made veterans events their soapbox. In the 19th century, it was anti-Reconstructionists and populists, in the 20th, Wilsonian Democrats and civil rights era reactionaries. This continues today in Lost Cause Spaces Online, where pro-Confederate blogs, Facebook groups, and subreddits fearmonger about cancel culture just as much as they celebrate Civil War history. Those websites sure love you. Oh yeah, big fans. In the late 19th century, a major goal of the Lost Cause religion was to institutionalize itself. Early, Pendleton, Jones, and others were keenly aware that passing their ideas down to the next generation would be crucial to preserving the Confederate legacy. So they focused their advocacy on the education system. Now that the United Confederate Veterans and United Daughters of the Confederacy were established and active, Lost Cause Evangelists had an organizational network to spread their ideas. Young women of the pre-war planter class, finding themselves in need of income after the abolition of slavery, gravitated toward teaching, and by the 1890s dominated primary school education. Reverend Jones and Susan Pendleton Lee, who was William Pendleton's daughter, both authored popular textbooks in the 1890s advancing the Lost Cause mythos, and Jones urged his fellow ex-Confederates to fight tooth and nail against the introduction of northern authored textbooks into southern classrooms. We should demand the abolition of Yankee school histories from our schools. And if they force the issue, we should squarely meet it and fight for a change in our school authorities if they persist in using Yankee school histories. Ex-Confederate's mission to indoctrinate the rising generation was a resounding success. By the turn of the 20th century, the culture war was won, and the impact of that victory was soon felt all around the country. In 1896, post-war racial issues came to a head with the Supreme Court ruling Plessy v. Ferguson, which of course established separate but equal as a law of the land. White Southerners accepted legal segregation to be an effective substitute for slavery as a tool to control the black underclass. When the Spanish-American War and World War I gave the reunited states a new sense of national purpose, white Northerners grew more inclined toward reconciliation, and many came to accept the Lost Cause version of Civil War history. Essentially, to reunite white America, Northerners sacrificed the rights and dignity of black America. Blacks had fought and died for the Union, and were instrumental in quelling the rebellion. But the Jim Crow era saw the Confederate vision of a white supremacist nation rise from the grave. Hell, the federal government even retired the hated blue uniform. In the trenches of the Western Front, Northern and Southern soldier alike wore khaki. But that wasn't the reason behind that decision. Most militaries switched to khaki uniforms around the turn of the 20th century. You should know this. <clears throat> still a hell of a metaphor though, ain't it? I'm still skeptical that everybody would just go along with this. Well, in the 20th century, the Lost Cause had a lot of help from the most effective propaganda tool in human history. The movies.
D.W. Griffith's infamous 1915 blockbuster The Birth of a Nation and the classic 1939 historical epic Gone with the Wind both reflected and cemented white supremacist interpretations of Civil War history in American culture. By the time Julius Howell was interviewed in the 1940s, the Lost Cause was firmly established in the popular imagination of a deeply segregated America. But then, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, things changed. The Civil Rights Movement was a major blow to white supremacy in America. And as people of color gained more social and political agency, historians began to focus more on black perspectives in American history. The story that emerged from this research was a continuous struggle against authoritarianism and bigotry that resonated with Americans of the Vietnam era. In contrast, the lost cause came increasingly to be seen as a hateful and oppressive ideology, and mainstream historiography started to seriously question its legitimacy. The cat was out of the bag. In the 80s and 90s, historians like Gary Gallagher, James McPherson, Gaines Foster, and others thoroughly dismantled the tenets of the lost cause with some excellent scholarship. But there remained a serious disconnect between this growing academic consensus on one hand and the perception of the public at large on the other. The 1990 Ken Burns documentary The Civil War and the 1993 Ron Maxwell film Gettysburg spawned a huge surge of public interest in the Civil War, but they also propagated common misconceptions with origins in the Lost Cause myth. The Burns documentary's over-reliance on narration by Southern novelist Shelby Foote left many viewers with a mistaken impression of the causes of secession, and the overwrought sentimentality and sanitized violence of Maxwell's film glorified the war and the soldiers who fought in it. It also downplayed the importance of slavery to the Confederate cause. Gettysburg inspired thousands of people to become Civil War reenactors, and to this day, at public events, many reenactors will teach a version of Civil War history more inspired by the movie than by actual evidence. Are you about to shit on gods and generals again? Just one more time, please, and then I'll be done forever. You really can't help yourself, can you? The Lost Cause regained even more ground in 2003 with Gods and Generals, Maxwell's prequel to Gettysburg. This film wholeheartedly endorses the most counterfactual aspects of the Lost Cause myth and has done enormous damage to public understanding of the Civil War. Heavily based on late 19th century Lost Cause histories, the film has become a banner for white supremacists and neo-Confederates to rally under, a powerful 21st century expression of the Lost Cause religion. Great movie! The South was right! But then came the 2010s and the dawn of a new and wide-ranging social justice movement. Police brutality against black Americans in particular proved to be a major flashpoint for lingering racial issues. This new movement is complex and contentious, and since it's ongoing, it's difficult to make categorical statements. But one thing we seem to be in the midst of is an attempt to break down systemic inequality in the government and economy, which has led to a far more critical historiography of the eras of American history when those systems were established. The growing interest in black history seems to be inversely proportional to the lost cause's staying power. As more and more Americans renounced the Confederacy for the slavers' rebellion that it was, those still cleaving to the Lost Cause religion have become more culturally isolated, their ceremonies, rituals, and catechisms increasingly esoteric and irrelevant. Over the past decade, the Lost Cause has taken a severe beating, maybe even a fatal one. And a tiny part of that has been this show. Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? But you are unfit to lick the boots of the Confederate heroes you defame. You dare insult General Lee? General Jackson? Well, let me tell you something, Billy. You will never compare to the man that Thomas Jackson was, for you will never be remembered or mentioned 160 years after your death with all your videos. Probably not. If this show is remembered, I would guess it would be as a small footnote of Civil War history's intersection with 21st century internet culture. If we're fortunate enough to have any legacy at all, I fully expect Checkmate Lincolnites to be considered an imperfect product of its time, like all written or filmed history. I hope we're remembered as a nail in the coffin of the lost cause, but who knows? Only time will tell. But there's one prediction that I am reasonably certain about. If things keep going the way they're going, the lost cause is doomed. The myth is like a frail, diseased, very racist old man drawing rattling breaths from a life support system. Can't we just go ahead and pull the plug?
1984. Oh my God. 1984. The cultural Marxists and the radical left are seeking to erase the truth of Civil War history. I will always stand for the truth, no matter how unpopular it may be. You're projecting. The evangelists of the lost cause rewrote history in the late 19th century. Now their work is finally being undone. We're finally course correcting away from all their madness and their baggage, and you can't fucking handle it. You're not even pretending to be objective anymore. You reveal yourself for what you've always been. A biased, moralizing, Yankee soul boy! God damn it, Johnny! You never give me the benefit of the doubt! Most people think you're a fucking racist scum of the earth because you fly this fucking flag. You think I'm the bad guy? No. I'm coddling you like the big fucking baby you are trying to gently coax you into the 21st century before the people behind me fucking drag you there. People think you are a fucking joke, Johnny. You've been discredited time and again. But your monuments are coming down. Your staunchest advocates are doddering old fools and pretty soon they're gonna be in the fucking ground. What? What have we been doing all this time? Have I been talking to a brick wall? Jesus! <laughs> the sword of Baron Samadhi, Loa of the Dead. And to keep off cemeteries. My lord, with all due respect, I'm uncomfortable with this voodoo ritual. It doesn't feel very Christian to me. Fear not, my patriotic friend. You have but a small part to play in it. What do I need to do? Die. of the Southland. The time for your vengeance has come. Rise up and claim your destiny. Rise up! Rise up! Rise up! Yeah. Ha 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 